I love that guy. Are you grateful for Thomas? I'm thankful for him and his leadership here. And yeah, we have a lot of fun together. Uh, before we jump into our text, and it's going to be a good day, I want to remind you of where we've been this year. Early in the year, we kicked off a vision that we call unimaginable, and it reflects our desire to have an exponential impact on our city in the days ahead. And part of that includes expanding our facility. We're going to uh, construct a brand new auditorium sanctuary, 800 seats out front, um, re redo many of our kids' spaces to expand that, and then triple the size of our auditorium lobby so that there are more gathering spaces uh, for you and for our groups in and before uh, the services and after, of course. And so we're excited about that. I want you to mark your calendar for September 8th. We're throwing an unimaginable party before, during, and after every one of our services that will conclude after this service on September 8th, after our 1045, with an unimaginable lunch. It's going to be unimaginable. But we're going to talk about where God's leading. We're going to celebrate what he's done. We're going to invite you, if you've not been a part of it, to consider participating with us. It's going to be a sweet, sweet time. And then we're going to start breaking ground, get this project off the ground and, and this fall. And we're excited about that. And yeah, it's great. And it's a year-long project. So sometime around this time next year in the fall, we'll be in a brand new facility. And we're thankful for that. Yeah. I love you guys. Well, as Tim mentioned, we've been looking in the book of Proverbs, one of the most practical books in all of the Bible that helps us navigate the things that are most important to us from the work and industries we're in to our home life and our relationships to marriage, to the words we say and the way we spend our resources. And it's been a great series thus far. And today we get to talk about what Solomon gives a lot of space to, believe it or not, that is sexuality. Now, I got a couple of emails this week, so sometimes I get emails, okay? And these specifically said, why do we need to talk about sex again? If you were with us in May, in response to a question you asked, I uh, did a message on sex. My thought is most people are either doing it or thinking about it more than once a year, so if God's word leads us to it, we ought to talk about it, and I just want to honor the text. Not to mention, Proverbs gives over three and a half chapters to sexuality out of 31. That's 10%. I'm not going to teach on sex five times a year, okay, which would be 10%. I'll do it twice, all right, and then we'll call it good probably till next year, and we'll come back around. But for today, we want to talk about this through the lens of Scripture, which I love, and we're going to talk about how important sex is and how much we care about it and why we should actually care about it more. And the truth is, we need wisdom as we care about it when it comes to navigating the complexities of our feelings and our desires and our dreams when it comes to sex. For example, I've got some friends in New England. Uh, they've got some young little kids. And so they decided not too long ago to prioritize sex in their marriage. And so on their eye calendar in their phone, they put a standing appointment called Funky Town, okay? <laughs> now, no interpretation needed there, all right? Until their middle school son comes to them. This is no joke. This is total truth. Young son comes to them, a middle school guy, and he says, Dad, I was looking at your calendar on your phone. What is Funky Town? And why is it on there every week? Because we lack creativity, all right? <laughs> Needless to say, my friends immediately changed their standing appointment to brush teeth. So now they brush their teeth once a week, whether they need it or not. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> no joke. It's real. You know, we can laugh about that regardless of whether you're, we're young or old because most of us will agree that there's something mysteriously wonderful about sex. In fact, leave this place and virtually everyone you cross paths with will tell you that sex matters and not just a little. Woody Allen is famous for saying, I don't know the question, but sex is definitely the answer, okay? Okay showing our culture's obsession with it. Studies today show that young singles are waiting longer to get married. You ask, well, why is that? Are they preparing for marriage by reading books and applying the principles of Proverbs to their lives? Maybe, but there's also another reason, which is they don't want to mess with marriage because it's socially acceptable today to have sex without marriage, and so the numbers are increasing. Another study reveals that 41% of American adults have cohabitated at some point with someone who's not their spouse, which is an increase in almost 72% in 10 years. 
So it's undeniable that we care about sex. The good news is that Proverbs actually cares about sex more than we do. It has a lot to say about and celebrate about it as well, which may come as a surprise because some of us came into the room this morning believing that God is prudish and largely against sex unless it's absolutely necessary. And others of us absolutely believe that sex is merely a biological response to endure internal desires that we are unable to control. But both views fall short of the vision that God gives us in the scriptures that communicate and elevate the beauty and the life-giving potential of sex as God created it. And today, with our limited time, I want to show you that from the scriptures. So if you've got your phone, get it out, go to Proverbs chapter 5. If you've got your Bible, open that up, and we'll show the text on the screen as well. And I want to jump right into the middle of Solomon's conversation in sex, which takes a majority of chapters 5, 6, and 7, and then we'll come around to chapter 30. Keep in mind, this is poetry. So don't take it at face value. You've got to see what it's pointing to. Verse 15, drink water from your own well. It's not about water. Share your love only with your wife. Why spill the water of your springs in the streets having sex with just anyone? You should reserve it for yourselves. Never share it with strangers. Let your wife be a fountain of blessing for you. Rejoice in the wife of your youth. In verse 19, this make you blush a little. She's a loving deer, a graceful doe. Let her breast satisfy you always. May you always be captivated by her love. Now, fellas, little caveat. Do not go home today and try to quote Proverbs chapter 5 to your wife thinking that it will lead to a little romance, okay? She might enjoy being called a graceful doe. Odds are probably not, unless that's your thing. But you need to probably find some fresh poetry, okay? That said, I'm going to break this down for you. The focus of this passage, like many other commands in Scripture, is not to primarily forbid something negative, but to protect something positive. For example, the phrase to drink water is to quench sexual thirst through lovemaking. And I want you to notice that both the man and the woman are called to satisfy one another sexually. Now, this may not come as a surprise to you because we live in the land of GQ and Cosmo where it's sort of assumed that husbands and wives or men and women who aren't husbands and wives would satisfy one another sexually. In fact, if you didn't know that, you can find the latest 100 ways to satisfy one another sexually in your grocery counter market, okay? That said, there's something bigger at play here. And here's what it is. This is written over a 1,000 years ago when it was expected that a man would have a wife to care for the children and the home, and at the same time, he'd have a little side gig of a couple of concubines who would provide him with sexual pleasure. God turns that cultural norm on its head and calls men and women to a whole new approach to sex that is mutually enjoyable and exclusive in the context of marriage. Jesus consistently taught the same thing. In fact, in Mark chapter 10, he celebrates sex as a mingling of souls between a man and a woman who are united together in marriage. He says, this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united in, into one, and the original language there includes one flesh, which is deeply sexual in, in language. They are no longer two but one. From beginning to end, and if we had, you know, more time today, I could show you more examples, not the least of those being an entire book that Solomon wrote called Song of Songs, which elevates sex continually uh, between a man and a woman from the time they meet to their engagement to their wedding, where they unite together in marriage and sexually, and it celebrates it as a gift from God. Now, the question we've got to ask and what I want to spend the rest of our time in together today is this. If God is pro-sex, then why do we have places in the Bible that seem to set boundaries around sex? Why would God take something so beautiful and place limitations around it? Why? 
Well, I think the best place to go to begin answering that question is in Proverbs chapter 30. So look there with me, beginning in verse 18. Solomon says, three things amaze me. No four things I don't understand. And, you know, when you read poetry, you got to kind of get into the mind of what it must have been like as Solomon's reading this. I imagine him on a front porch in a rocker drinking Pellegrini, thinking, okay, there are three things. No, four. Four amaze me. Here's what he says. How an eagle glides through the sky. How a snake slithers on a rock. How a ship navigates the ocean. And how a man loves. Oh, isn't that great? That's good poetry. All right? Solomon, what he's doing here is celebrating sex by comparing it to breathtaking realities of his day. I mean, a ship that sails on the sea, stunning. You know, an eagle that glides through the sky, piercing it, beautiful. I don't really get the snake part, okay, just to be honest. <laughs> but it must have been wonderful. And he says, in the same way, sex is beautiful, it's deep, it's breathtaking, it's wonderful, it's worth paying attention to. But then look at verse 20, because he takes a hard left turn. And he said, but an adulterous woman, and I'll say an adulterous person, this is written from the context of a man to his son, so we've got to contextualize this for audiences and say, but an adulterous person consumes a man, or if it's a man, consumes a woman. Or if it's a man, it consumes a man, or a woman could consume a woman. And then wipes her mouth and says, what's wrong with that? And this is saying, don't miss this, this is saying that while sex can be beautiful and productive, it can also be messy and destructive. And sex can lead to a lot of heartache. And many of us know from our personal stories that that's true, don't we? And I want to explain this and then bring to life why God, I believe, puts boundaries around something good that he's created. One of my favorite places in the country is the Royal Gorge in Colorado. Anyone ever been there? Been to the Gorge? Good. Just southwest of Colorado Springs. Beautiful space. Draws over 300,000 visitors a year. Surrounded by canyon walls that reach upwards of 1,000 feet on both sides. The Arkansas River flows through the gorge for six miles, producing some of the most powerful whitewater rapids in our country and around the world. When kept within its boundaries, the Arkansas is a place of stunning beauty. The gorge is an exhilarating place that draws uh, mountaineers and climbers and extreme hikers and boaters from around the world. But if that same river escapes its boundaries, as it has many times, there is great potential for harm, such as in 1913 when the Arkansas flooded, forming a lake 65 miles wide and consuming over a half million acres. Solomon says sex, when kept within the boundaries of God's masterful design, is a source of breathtaking beauty, adventure, and life-giving potential. However, if it moves past those boundaries, it can rob us of the unity and the joy and the goodness that God created and intends for sex to bring about. Now, the culture will not tell you this. You're not going to read this on Cosmo, Hannaford, okay, or hy V. You're not going to do that. In order to understand this, you've got to expose the myths of our culture and get underneath them to see if they're actually telling you what is true. So if you're taking notes, I'm going to give you two myths in our culture today that are told to you again and again and again in print, in media, in social media, in film, in song. They're communicated to you over and over again. And you've got to get underneath these myths to see if what they're telling you is actually true. The first myth is this. Many will say that we are freest when we are free of all boundaries, free of all limitations. For example, every year the United Kingdom hosts Europe's biggest swingers party for couples to come, throw off all constraints, and enjoy three days of hedonistic fun. Basically, it's consensual sex anywhere with anyone. One neighbor was interviewed about this and said, we're happy about it. After all, it's just people having sex in the open air. One well-known entertainer who writes songs that maybe you listen to or your kids listen to 
or their friends listen to, recently said, I'm literally open to every single thing that is of age and consenting and doesn't involve an animal. I'm down with anyone over the age of 18 who is down to love me. And your kids are listening to the music. Another example, one of the greatest uh, documentaries of time in terms of exposing today's casual sex and hookup culture um, was in it, a, a young person was interviewed. If you want to look further into this, I would encourage you to watch it delicately, maybe not include your kids yet, but I referenced it at length in May, and it exposes the hookup culture of our day, but one young person was interviewed about sex and, and our culture's view of sex, and they said, you know what, during spring break, we just meet on the beach, we get drunk, we go back to the hotel, we have sex, we go about our lives like we never met. And what they're saying is reflective of the culture that we are at our best and freest when we have no limitations, no boundaries. We can do whatever we want. Listen, the problem with that idea is that it lacks integrity and it doesn't hold up. I'll give you a crazy illustration and then I'll bring it around. If a fish decides that it is sick and tired of being constrained to the land and hops up onto the shore one day, its freedom will not last very long, will it? No. If in the same way you see a fish in water and think, my, how miserable it must be to be relegated to the boundaries of the sea, I'm going to free it and put it on land so it can explore the rest of creation. You have not done a great gift to that fish, but in fact, a disservice. Why is that? Because a fish is created for what? Water, and it's within the confines of its design that it's actually freest to live the best. In the same way, real freedom is found not in living by our desire, free of limitations, but by our design. Here's the second myth that we see in our culture today. The second myth says we should always follow our desires no matter what they tell us. Because our desires will always tell us what is best? We've been taught from a young age by Ariel the Mermaid or Lady Gaga or Oprah Winfrey that the way to find happiness is to follow our hearts. But once again, this view lacks integrity because what happens when your heart tells you to do something that's not very good for you? For example, I love fatty, buttery foods. In fact, one of my favorite experiences, Beth will tell you, is to take my kids to a movie so I get to eat popcorn, okay? It's not really about them. I I tell them it is. And then we get the large at AMC so that you can get a free what? Refill. So you know. Got some brothers and sisters in here. And so I get that big popcorn, and I act like I'm going to share, and I do a little bit, hoping they won't ask for more so I can continue to consume the original and the refill. And what happens at the end of the day is I live in pure misery. In fact, at age 42, I have some serious digestive problems as a result of this. That's more than you wanted to know, okay? (laughs) Wow. You will never look at me the same. Beth tells me each time, Jed, I have no idea why you do this. And I say, in effect, it's because my heart tells me to. I want it, okay? And every time I suffer for it. In the same way, sometimes your desires tell you to do things that aren't actually very good for you, such as have you ever been cut off in traffic and in that moment you want to run that punk over, you want to get out of the car and tell him all of the things your mama told you not to say, okay? Do you ever have that twinge of rage? And don't tell me you have not had that, okay? Otherwise, there's a whole different message on deceit and honesty I could teach. But let me ask you, because I have that desire, does that mean that that desire is good? Sometimes. I should do that. No, I'm just joking. No, no, it's not. It's not, and it's not right, which means sometimes from somewhere, it's a whole different message We have desires that actually aren't for our good or for the good of others. And the point is this. We desire all kinds of things that are harmful to us on any given day. Why should we think that our sexual desires are always right or good or for our benefit or the joy of the other person? Which leads me back to Proverbs chapter 30, and I want to do my best to break this apart and explain why I believe God places boundaries around sex and what those boundaries look like and why those boundaries, even if you doubt God's God's goodness, are ultimately for your joy. Look again at Proverbs 30. An adulterous, and I'll say person, woman or man, consumes another person, a man or a woman. 
then wipes their mouth and says, what's wrong with that? Now, we have this thing in the 21st century called cultural snobbery where we think a lot of our achievements are as a result of our own progression as a human species, and we think thoughts that no one else has thought before. And so this new urge we have to live free of all boundaries is fresh and new to us. But Solomon exposes that and says, no, before 1000 BC, people were thinking this way as well. Many people, many people engage in sexual intimacy with someone else, wipe their mouth and say, what's the big deal? We're just having sex. We're just showing each other a good time. And Solomon says, if we choose to say, what could possibly be wrong with pursuing the kinds of sexual encounters or sexual partners our hearts desire, God in his wisdom might say that we're playing on the banks of the Arkansas River at flood stage, just hoping that the waters don't consume us, which is why he gives us boundaries. The boundaries, once again, are for our joy, and the boundaries are wrapped up in this little word at the beginning of verse 20. And it's a word that's used over and over in Scripture, but so often it's misunderstood. And here in the Old Testament, it's the word adulteress, translated in to the New Testament, it's the word adultery oftentimes, and it comes from an original word called porneia, from where we get our English word, pornography. And it refers to any sex outside of the marriage between a man and a woman. And Jesus, in Matthew 5, commands us to avoid it. In fact, he goes so far as to say that porneia even includes fantasizing about a person and having sex with them with a person to whom we are not married. So if if it arouses sexual excitement or desire, Solomon says, Jesus affirms, the biblical writers would say, and again, again, it is reserved for a man and a woman who are united together in marriage. Now listen, the moment I say that, all sorts of questions come to mind, don't they? I mean, some of you are saying, Jed, I get what you mean about a one-night stand, but we're in love, and we're probably going to get married. What's the big deal? And I would ask you, have you legally bound yourself to another person in marriage, or are you wanting them to donate their body to you without accepting their whole person in a covenant? And if you've not legally united yourself to them in marriage, then Jesus would say, it's porneia. You say, well, what about oral sex? Does that count? I'd say, well, well, is that sexual? Most of the time, yes. That's a joke. Some of you are like, really? I I never thought of that. No, (laughs) I think so. You say, well, what if we don't go all the way? Let me ask the question, is what you're doing sexual? Another question you could ask is, would I want my grandmother in the room with me? That's probably an overstatement, but you get the point. You say, well, what about me and a computer screen late at night? No harm, no foul, right? And I'd say, does it arouse? Are you watching your husband or wife, or is it someone else? Then it's Pornea, if not. You say, what about friends with benefits? That's a stupid question, okay? All right. Now, maybe you're still saying, Jed, but what's wrong with two consenting, loving adults coming together in this way? If God's against that, some of you are saying this still, and I want to press into this very graciously. If God's against that, he must not be for our joy. He must not be for my joy. And I want to finish my time by giving you two reasons why I believe God is not only for your joy, but why you should have a more elevated view of the sacredness of sex than you have right now. And here are the two reasons. Number one, many people today want to believe that in sex we can separate the body from the heart. But reason number one, the truth is that our bodies, hearts, and minds are radically connected to one another. And in sex, we become radically interconnected with another person, mind, body, and soul. 
Tim Keller wrote a journal on Proverbs. I've referenced it multiple times. In this particular section, he writes this. I think it's so good. Our natural impulse is to find sex a very big deal and to become emotionally involved. Now, you want proof for this. You just step into a high school boy's locker room, and they'll tell you how big of a deal it is. Over and over again, they'll champion their sexual exploits or the ones they think they want all their buddies to think they have. But here's what Keller says. You think you can do that with your bodies, but your hearts always go with your body. Only after you train yourself to take physical pleasure without the full personal commitment of marriage do the soul and the body become detached. And then you can have sex without being too emotionally involved. And as Solomon wrote, you just wipe your mouth. But here's how he concludes, and you can read on the screen. Sex should instead be a way to both display and deepen full trust. It is a radical, unconditional, deeply personal means of self-donation. It's God's created way to say to someone else, I belong wholly and exclusively to you. If you use it to say that and mean that, at time, as time goes on, it will enable spouses to indeed become more indissolubly one in each other's. If you don't use it like that, sex will become routine, then boring, and there will be no wonder left in it. Keller's right. And what he's saying is one of the reasons why sex is so wonderful is because it is all-consuming in our lives. And when we allow it to flow within the boundaries that God creates, it has created it for, it actually deepens our commitment and our joy with the person we've united our life to. But here's the second reason. I just want to bring it to life a little bit more. The second reason you should consider sex to be more sacred than it is is because in the Bible, God consistently uses metaphors to describe the oneness he desires with his creation. And one of the most powerful metaphors he uses is that of Jesus being the groom and the church being his bride. In fact, by the time you come to the end of the Bible, Revelation 19 and 21, it says, when Jesus comes back, there will be a great wedding feast, and we'll celebrate together because the lamb, referring to Jesus, has been united with his bride in marriage. And it's saying what you and I experience in our marriages and what sex is ultimately the culmination of in terms of our commitment and intimacy together points to something greater. And when undefiled and left pure, it reminds us of how deep God's affection is for us. But if it escapes its boundaries, it can actually distort our understanding of God and his longing for us. Three ways that marriage and sex actually point toward God. One is this. In marriage, we experience total oneness. And that points to the oneness that God longs to have with us. So for Beth and I, when we on May 26, 2000, stood in Bellevue, Nebraska, on stage and said, I do to you for better or worse, I said to Beth, Beth, my future, my family, my stuff, my dreams, even my baggage, all of it for better or worse. She got a lot better, okay? Uh, I got a lot better. When she said yes to me, she got a lot worse, okay? But we just did this. We said, okay, we're gonna do this. And she accepted me with all of my baggage. So we shared our whole selves with each other. And the final element in that is to share our bodies together. Now, not to be overly graphic, all right? But I think you know this. In sex, there is complete oneness. Physical oneness is a demonstration and celebration of whole life oneness. And it points to the oneness that God longs to experience with us on a heart and soul level. Here's the second way that marriage points to God's desire for us, and that's exclusivity. Exclusivity, write that down. I also said to Beth on that day, honey, I will have no other woman but you. You are not one gal among many, okay? 
It's you and me. You're the only one for me. And this also makes sense in sex, doesn't it? Because if you're having sex with someone, whether you want to admit it or not, you want them to be exclusively committed to you, don't you? And you don't want them to be out playing the field on you, do you? And trying to get a better experience or a better high or thrill the next night. Because it cheapens what we were created for and what our hearts long for. And that exclusivity that we experience in marriage that culminates in sex points to something greater. Number three, in marriage, we also experience unconditional acceptance. You know, what's supposed to happen in marriage is you experience unconditional approval because someone sees you exactly for who you are and they love you anyway. And this is most seen in sex when you're naked with someone and you're saying to them, I see you and I accept you and I approve of you for who you are and I'll never leave you and I'm yours forever. Listen, when it comes to our relationship with God, God has poured out in our lives the very same unconditional acceptance, hasn't he? Isn't it true that the beauty of the gospel is that God came for us when we were at our worst and gave us his best? He took us in as a bride that had gone astray. He poured out his affection, called us back into his arms, placed the seal of love over our lives, and said, I will never leave you or forsake you. He placed his spirit in our lives being radically interconnected with us to give us power to live out the truth of what he's done in our lives as we follow Jesus and become like him. And his heart for you and me is that we would live lives of radical exclusivity to him, loyal through and through. And friends, when you see Jesus for who he is, you will learn to trust his unfailing love for you. And only then will you be willing to bring your life under the kingship of what he says over all your life, including your sexuality. But if you don't trust Jesus, you'll never follow the ways of Jesus. And so today, if you like me for a significant part of my life would say, you know what, I've not followed the wisdom of Jesus when it comes to my sexuality. If you're saying that today, you might be asking the question, well, is there hope for me? Can my story change? You know, can my past be renewed? Can my shame be undone? Can my guilt, sense of guilt be forgiven? Can my brokenness be reconciled? And I will tell you both from my own story of God uh, redeeming me from brokenness sexually and giving me a new song to sing of his faithfulness, that the answer is absolutely yes. Because of Christ, there is hope for everyone. But I'll also point you to a truth years ago that radically changed my life because you can't root your life only in my story. I, my story can encourage you, but it can't sustain you. Jesus' promise can. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17, Paul writes, this means that anyone who belongs to Jesus Christ has become a new person. The old has gone, and the new has come. And I just wonder if there's some of us today who are saying, but yeah, there's too much old, and Jesus says, no. When you come to me by faith and embrace me in your life as the king of your life, I do away with the old, and I bring a brand new beginning. Some of you say, but there's so much old baggage that's hanging on. I love Philippians. It says that when we place our faith in Jesus, he nails to the cross the sins that we committed. And as a result, we walk in a brand new friendship with him. The old has gone, the new has come. I love the book of Colossians that says that though we were lost in sin and our stories had taken us away from God, Jesus laid down his life for us. And as a result of Jesus standing in him by faith, now I can stand before the throne of God, holy, blameless, and without fault. Friends, not because of what I've done or what you've done, but because of what Jesus has done. And so today, would you tether your life to him by faith? 
And I want to pray for you in a moment. And if that's true of your story, I, I just want to invite you to join me in a prayer. If the desire of your heart is for Jesus to make things new, maybe for the first time, maybe you've never started a relationship with him and today can be that day when you say, Jesus, I embrace you by faith as my Savior and my King. Or, or friends, maybe you have been walking with him, but you need him to make something new in your life. I just want to invite you to pray along with me. So would you bow your heads and, and would you join me quietly where you're at in prayer, where God is moving today? Father, in this moment, we want to say thank you for the gift of sex. We want to say thank you for marriage. Never in a, in a million years could, could we have dreamt up such a wonderful, beautiful gift. When you give us a gift, God, you give us boundaries because you care so much for us. And even right now, we want to declare thank you for those boundaries, for guarding our hearts and our minds and our bodies from hurt and hardship and even pain. But I also thank you, God, that for those of us, myself included, who have strayed beyond those boundaries, Jesus, that you don't give up on us, but you call us back and you make us new and you give us a brand new beginning. And so today, as we pray, if your desire is for Jesus to give you a brand new beginning, maybe it's for the first time, will you just tell him that right now? Will you just say, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, thank you for loving me. Jesus, I need you to forgive me inside and out and to make me new. And today by faith, just say this, today by faith, I embrace you as the one who saves me and the king of my life, and I want to go your way. With every head still bowed, if that is your desire, we would love to come alongside you. Let us know the decision that you're making today, and we want to help you take next steps, including the next step of declaring your love for Jesus through baptism. And you can mark that on your connection card or visit us in the Next Steps Hub. But as we continue to pray today, I just want to pray over our marriages, God. I want to pray over men and women today. Um, I want to pray for unity, for joy. I want to pray that you would revive marriages where there's brokenness, that you would reconcile where there's division. I pray for uh, people right now who are trying to figure out how to walk with you in this area, that you give them courage to say yes to you, Jesus, and to follow you trusting in your goodness. So, Father, if you lead us and as you lead us, we want to walk with you and we want to say yes to you and we want to Make your name great by the way that we live, especially in the area of our sexuality, Jesus. It is in your name we pray together. We pray, amen, amen.